Hello, in this um, lecture we're going to talk about socialization um, and at first the basic ideas having to do with socialization. Uh, and in this we're talking about how a person becomes a social being, the development of the individual to integrate within the society. Uh, and acquiring, it's not only the individual integrating into the society, but rather the uh, individual acquiring those factors in the social structure which makes him part of the society. Uh, so we can call this, and, and so we call this socialization. Um, and in other words, it's acquiring culture. Because we define culture as the way of life of a people, in other words, the, the, uh, the uh, shared and human created strategies for adapting and responding to the social and physical environment. So in order to that to happen, a child must acquire a sense of self. In other words, theoretically, uh, when a child is born, a child doesn't have any boundaries. This slave like, feels united and one with his environment, doesn't know where his body, his or her body starts or stops or anything like that. Um, there are a few inborn instinctual behaviors such as the rooting behavior, uh, there are inborn fears such as the fear of heights or loud noises, uh, and these are natural but there's a, everything else seems to have to be learned. Uh, so everything is learned from the very very start and we're going to talk about some of those processes until we become uh, full-fledged full-fledged, that's a, a lousy term, but human beings are people are part of the society where we can um, understand the significance of the material and the non-material uh, culture and how we can use these factors to express ourselves or to integrate ourselves or to connect with other people. Um, and so through this process of socialization, a child uh, internalizes the society's ways of thinking, uh, his ways of appearing and the ways of behaving. Uh, now we can call this an initial process, initial process, but in in fact, it's a process that goes on throughout a person's life. So, as I said before, first have to uh, notice and take into account uh, how a person uh, how a person gets a sense of self. Uh, in the in the text, we have a experiment where. Uh, a child is given a piece and uh, put up a, a, a touch of a red dot of, of uh, uh, makeup on on the child's nose and as a very small child looking in the mirror the child has, doesn't care one way or the other it's like somebody else but as a child gets older then at a certain point she will notice and say well what is that thing going on doing on my face uh, so in other words the child has identified a sense of se a sense of self. Uh, this is obviously um, a first stage um, of uh, a developing as an individual. We're also talking about develop developing as an individual within the culture, which is much more important for society. We'll go back to some of these more psychological theories uh, further on in, in, in later lectures. Um, but through the socialization process it becomes uh, identified as I'm a male, she's female, I am of this ethnicity, I am of that age, I am a child, I am an adult, um, uh, I am a uh, person of this family or that family, etc., etc. So be able to identify what group a person belongs to. Uh, interesting, would you say that do, to societies and cultures have um, have personalities? Well, that would be a question that one might want to think of because if we're talking about a personal personality, that's one thing. We so certainly understand that as Americans. What about societies? Do societies have particular personalities that a child has to grow uh, go into? It's not only a particular uh, uh, individual. And we find that the anthropologists in particular will find that there are extremes from one end to the other of how uh, society might have a personality. Like for instance, um, I'll just take the two extremes. The Semi of Malaysia, it's a, it's a uh, group, a, a, a tribe 
that lives or a nation, I'm not exactly sure how, how they're 100% defined, but they are completely nonviolent. There's no fights in that, uh, in that society at all. As a matter of fact, the way they, if there are disagreements, they'll come and have a community meeting and um, they're more to be worried about being embarrassed than having, uh, having some sort of fight. The children actually do fight. They take sticks and hit themselves, but they never hit each other, but they never actually make contact with a stick on their friend so that they have some sort of aggressive fight, but they never hurt each other. Um, and that would be one extreme. On the other extreme, there's the Amazon tribes, or nation, there's a lot of, a lot of tribes, of the Yanamano, Yanamamo, which are uh, very, very uh, uh, fierce and warlike. Uh, they are trained, they train their adult, their, their males to be uh, warriors, and probably 35% of the males actually die in warfare. Uh, so it's it's a, a, and, and they're proud to be that type of aggre a, a, aggression. Uh, so there are actually very extreme differences in the society themselves. Um, so the by the time and we find that by the time the children are about two years old, um, they can take. Uh, a lot of they pay a lot of attention to the rules of the way things have to be. Uh, this is by the time that people are able uh, learning uh, how to control uh, control some of their urges when they start to control their uh, uh, biological uh, need to uh, defecate. Uh, they're learning how to do that, and they internalize they internalize the um, the rules which are uh, which are important uh, are, which are important for them to. Uh, behave in as a member of the society. So, if we want to think, the question then would be, how much is this internal, or how much is this made? I uh, know uh, how much is this internal and intrinsic and comes from the person inside, or how much is it from the society impinging upon the person? And this question is the question of nature versus nurture. Nature being the natural way of doing things and nurture being somebody uh, giving from the outside. Uh, and truth of the matter is, although there's been huge amounts of discussions concerning this, whether it's, it's nature, some, something is na natural or nurtured, if it's environmental or inborn, any of our more human characteristics have a combination of the two and it's constantly changing. Depending upon, besides a few minor things such as the need to eat, right, uh, a fear of loud noises and fear of heights, um, it's impossible to judge whether any particular thing is more is completely nature or nurture, or even how much. I think the best way of thinking about it is that nature gives the range of possibilities, right. So some might, might be naturally a tendency to be a genius, or might naturally not have the capacity to learn more than average. Right? But the nurture will uh, allow that person or uh, define where the person is going to fall within his natural boundaries and may give the shape of what, that ba of, of what that's going to look like. And uh, so nature gives the range of possibilities and nurture shapes and puts the person in a particular place within that possibilities. So what would be the extremes there also? Um, I, the question which seems to come is can a, per, can a human child exist without human culture? Is it possible? And of course there's been many, many questions across the years of something called feral children. F-E-R-A-L. Feral children. Children who were for some reason or another uh, grew up and were nurtured outside of human culture and in animal culture, in the woods, in the forest, or things like that. And it's very, very, there have been stories like this from the, uh, according to the, the uh, uh, Roman mythology, Rome was founded by twins, Remus and Romulus, who were, um, uh, were uh, children of a Vestal Virgin, but they hadn't thought of Immaculate Conception at that time, so uh, she was uh, punished of some sort, and the children were, were, were to be 
uh, were to be put to death and somebody decided to save them and put them on the river and they were taken in by a, a wolf and they were raised by wolves and they grew up to found this great city of Rome. That was the legend then. But, you know, there hasn't really been a lot of really feral children. There's been a couple of famous cases uh, that, uh, uh, of children that were grown in, uh, in uh, uh, were found in the, in the, uh, in the, in the woods uh, one which was particularly more that there's uh, uh, that seems to actually have lived in the in, in, in with monkeys for a period of time was a fellow uh, in um, I think it was Uganda I don't remember exactly where or South Africa Dan Sab uh, Sabunius uh, who was found living with uh, verdant monkeys and he was taken in an orphanage and he was uh, raised there and until today he actually is still alive. Uh, and he does know a little bit how to play with monkeys and monkey uh, culture. Uh, but he apparently ran away from his house at four years old after being severely abused. And mostly questions of, of, um, of feral children were actually questions of, uh, of children being abused prior. This particular fellow, John, uh, has a, some sort of injury in his brain which stops him from learning language. And most of the feral children obviously don't have language. Uh, that's one of the, this, the stories that is uh, rampant across the feral children uh, uh, spectrum. But in truth, it's probably more of a question, uh, a question of if children can grow up, how much do they need if they were grown without a human culture while they were in their parents' house, of so extreme neglect. Uh, and these, unfortunately, we have these cases uh, throughout years, um, there, this is such as such as a story um, as uh, a um, children who were found. A, a couple of children were found in the nineteen. I don't remember. Well, we remember there was a story about uh, the the people who were uh, this Austrian guy who kept his children. They were, they, they, and and they, what happens is at least one thing, one thing we know that the abuses has a lot of uh, uh, problems with it, but even more so um, we find that uh, they can't learn language after a certain time period. There's a, there's a period of time where a child has in order to learn language. Later than that, it becomes very, very difficult or impossible for a child to learn language. Uh, you can cover this more in psychology. Uh, furthermore, there is more importantly, we find that there is a, a the the effects of isolation and lack of nurture is fantastically um, uh, dangerous for the human child. Uh, and children, there be there there are uh, classical studies of children uh, who were at one point grown in orphanages and, and, and orphanages at one time they just took the babies put them in uh, in uh, uh, beds and nurses would efficiently and quickly feed them and, and, and change them and go on and these children uh, a fellow named Spitz in the 1920s or 30s uh, looked at these uh, children I'm not sure of the dates uh, and found that they were most of them became very retarded and many of them did not survive and he changed the possibility, gave some of these children to be taken care of by uh, uh, people who, uh, women and girls who were uh, suffering mental disability, mental retardation. These children, compared to the ones in the original uh, orphanage setting, the children were taken care of by incompetent mothers, but were nurturing and played with them, grew up to be normal children. Um, uh, in addition, I, you should look into the ideas of the uh, Harlow monkey experiments where children were given over to, um, and not children, monkeys. Monkeys were given, uh, were given uh, a choice of getting food from a wire mesh monkey as against uh, being nurtured or held by a terry cloth monkey. And these monkeys would invariably uh, invariably get the food from the uh, from the uh, wire mesh but would cling to the terry cloth showing that all primates need some sort of warmth and uh, in order to grow and survive